Well, we're going to read together Philippians chapter 3 and verses 15 through 21. Would you stand with me as we read again or read together? All of you who are mature should take such a view of things. And if some point and if it, and if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join with others in following my example, brothers and sisters, and take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. For as I have often told you before and now say again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Heavenly Father, praise you. We glorify you. I thank you, Father, for those things in the scripture that are so simple, they're so easy to grasp, And I thank you, Lord, for those things that sometimes are more difficult to grasp. And I pray today, Lord, that we will be good students of your word. That we won't be afraid today to think deeply about you and about the Savior. I thank you, Lord, for the the way the whole worship service today is has been somewhat of an introduction to this sermon today. We want to be good Christians. We want to be a good witness for you. We want to live a good life for you. But we live in a world with distractions We live in a world that calls us, a world that's trying to get us to conform to it, a world that even attracts us to sin, attracts us to abandon faith, challenges us about what faith really is, introduces concepts and theories and deceptions that draw our mind away presents before us lives that if we work hard enough, we can achieve certain lives and makes it seem as if this earth is the place where our citizenship is. Lord calls us by our senses to eat and drink and be happy. He calls us to deny you. And many have, Lord. It's not a few things, it's not a few people that take this role. Every one of us could tell of a story of a time when we drifted, time we were tempted, time we sinned, time we were confused, time we even stuck our hands in our pockets and kept our mouth closed and didn't say a single thing about you when we had the opportunity. Lord, bring us to a place of recognizing where we are and who we belong to. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. This is a um, 
a very good text of Scripture. I made the decision in my own study, and I see, I see that the uh, New International Version, at least, and perhaps others, you know how you see these things in paragraphs? As you look at your Bible, you'll see a paragraph, and it'll start in verse 12 is the beginning of a paragraph, and 15 is the beginning of a paragraph. Do you see that in your Bible? And also, it even gives you headings, pressing on toward the goal is what it says in the NIV Bible. And it's helpful. But sometimes it gives us the impression that this is how the Bible was written. Reality is, if you were to take a look at the book of Galatians, even in Greek, current Greek manuscripts or books, Bibles, you'd see that there, these headings aren't there. In fact, it's just, it's just text. In the original, there were no numbers. The numbers weren't there. They're not part of the inspired text. The paragraphs aren't uh, part of the inspired text. And the headings aren't part of the inspired text. And so as a result, as we study through, we start having kind of a sense as we read something of when something, a, a point is ended, another point is begun. That's just kind of how it is in conversation as well. In fact, don't we politely sit and wait for someone who's kind of filibustering and talking, 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 waiting for them to put a period in their sentence so that we can say something ourselves, perhaps? And we do it politely. And if we don't do it politely, we're doing what? We're interrupting them. Um, and so as a result, we see the same kind of feel for the Greek text. And the English text tries to help us by giving us these places of pause. Well, there is a place of pause between verse 12 and the end of the chapter. But it's not a whole week pause. Okay? It doesn't say pause for a week and pick this up next time. When you're reading a letter, you don't read to the letter and you say, up, oh, pause. And I'll come back next week or sometime, pick the letter up, and I'll fit, keep on. Oh, pause, I'll go the next week. Well, we do that because we don't want to be here. Well, you don't want to be here, <laughs> okay? <laughs> no, we all, we all want to see kind of like a cadence, right, a pace that's taking place. But it's important that we don't forget that these things are connected to one another. And I'm going to try to do that today as we look at these verses of Scripture to keep what's before in mind so that we don't get lost. It's easy to get lost when you read just a little bit, stop, and then in some cases miss church for a month and then come back and wonder where we are. And so you hear me doing this thing, don't you, where I kind of quickly go back and do a sweeping review and this kind of thing. And I've had, especially people that are here every week, some people say, do you really have to do that? We're with you. I say, well, you are, but there's some people that aren't. And so as a result, what I try to do is to give a little bit of an introduction. So I'm not going to go all the way back to verse 1, but I'm certainly going to look back as Paul looks back to the verses that he has talked about before. So let's start with verse 15. All of us then who are mature should take such a view of things. What things? What is he talking about when he says take such a view of things. And before that, as he says, all of us then, then, as a result of what we've discussed before, who are mature, let us, we should take a view of these things. Who are mature. Now that word mature is a, a, ver, a very interesting word in the Greek language. In its very rudimentary sense, in fact, some translations go this direction, all of us who are perfect, Simple word in Greek, it, it, it's translated perfect. Um, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. That same phrase, the same exact word is used there. It's used in a lot of different places. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13 um, and verse 6 and 7, we do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the perfect but not the wisdom of this age or of the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. We declare God's wisdom a mystery that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Notice that language. We speak a message of wisdom among the perfect. 
There's, it's riddled throughout a lot of places. In the love chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 9, For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when completeness comes, when perfection comes, that which is in part disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I began, became a man, I put the ways of childhood behind me, for now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. Notice that. We prophesy in part, but when perfection comes, King James says, when that which is perfect is come. The idea of being perfect. And we say, what is perfect? Well, if you look up the word perfect, you can look in a Greek lexicon and you can look in an English dictionary and you'll find pretty much the same thing. It means having reached the highest place, having arrived, completeness, perfection. And is Paul saying to us, or perhaps not to us, but he's saying to the Philippians, all of us then who are mature, well, I'm going to say mature right here, who are perfect. What does he mean when he says, if you're perfect? Does he believe in total perfection? Well, it's very clear he does not. In verse 12, look back at verse 12. He says, now that I have not, that I have already attained all this or have already arrived at my goal. But I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. Not that I have already obtained all this. Or not that I have already arrived at my goal. And so what he is doing is he's putting the word perfect in the context of something perhaps of himself, saying that I'm perfect. He's already made the case that we receive the faith of Christ. How do we come into faith? We receive the faith of Christ. We looked at that, we looked at that little word last time. Um, again, in a study of the Greek language, we don't see it saying faith in Christ, as if I'm putting something in deposit with Christ, but I, I have the faith of Christ. Christ's faith is what I have. I have it. Not that he has my faith, or I have put my faith in him, but he brings his faith into me. For by grace are you saved through faith. And this is not of yourself. It is the gift of God. Scripture says. And so as a result, I live by faith of the Son of God. Is Galatians 2.20. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. So we have received this gift within us it is the faith of God, and that faith of God believes. Of course, God's, Christ believes in the Father, right? Christ believes in heaven. Christ believes in the whole orientation of the universe being made by... Christ believes that, right? His faith believes it, and that faith is in me, so therefore I express myself through His faith. <laughs> That's kind of a simple, fundamental thing of Christianity. It's not me, not my faith, not my righteousness. It's his faith and his righteousness that live in me. And he says, all of us then who are perfect, who have this understanding that we don't live by our own faith, we don't live by our own righteousness, we live by the faith and the righteousness of Christ. We Understand the perfection of that principle. Do you understand that? Is that what you believe? When we think of that, we believe something, we take on something that we do not inherently have within ourselves. I don't have faith to believe in God within me outside of 
the Holy Spirit coming and regenerating me and the faith of Christ lives in me. I believe with the faith of Christ because that is the gift of God. What other gift would it be? We've thrown around this issue of faith so much that we don't get it. I need more faith. I need more faith. So what do you do? You read the Bible more. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the Word of God. So I read the Bible, read the Bible, read the Bible. I memorize it. I get all this faith in me. And what can I do with my faith? Well, I'm active. I can do things with my faith. My faith. I got more faith than you because I work at it. I, and I build my faith. It's like I you know, go and lift weights or something. I lift the faith weights. No. The faith of Christ is not something that grows and diminishes. It is an incomprehensible quantity. It is eternal. It is powerful. It is unchangeable. And all the other attributes that associate themselves to God, the faith of Christ it takes on those qualities. And we feel it. Yet we feel it as a deposit. I know in part, as Paul says. I know it's in part. He says, I haven't already attained it. I haven't already arrived at my goal. I want to make that clear to you. I haven't got it yet. I want it, but I haven't got it yet. I want the fullness of it, but I seem to have this part of it. By the way, you know, a deposit isn't just, you know, when, when someone says, okay, you got a million dollars, I owe you, I got to give you a million dollars, but I'm going to give you a deposit, so I'm going to give you, you know, $500. Well, the $500 has the same exact quality as the total. He doesn't say, I'm going to give you a deposit. What I'm going to do is I'm going to, you know, I'm going to give you the thing I wipe my glasses with, you know. Here's the, here's the deposit. But I promise a million, but here's the deposit. Say, like, no, I want something that has the value of the total. I want a part of the total. So when Christ deposits the faith within us, we have access to this faith that is the total, but we have no total access to it. Not yet. One day we will. One day we will have. It will come into its fullness and we will receive, as Paul said in Ephesians chapter 1, we receive the full inheritance. Until then, we have a deposit. And this deposit is something that's powerful. It still sustains us, still encourages us. You know, if you give me one-tenth of a million dollars, that's a lot of money. And, I, and, and I'll say, this is, this is really a motivator. Because you've got to keep straight, you've got to do certain things to make sure you get to the total. And so you've got to make sure you care for the deposit and you'll get the total. And so you think, man, I'm going to take care of this. Because it's so precious. It's so glorious. It's so wonderful. And Paul talks about this in the context of what he, when we get to this next phrase. But he, we need to see together that this idea of being perfect, and as they say mature, that really doesn't get it. I mean, it doesn't really get to say, those of us who are mature... Well, that's less like those of us who are perfect. I mean, to an arrogant person, that's not much difference, okay? We can, get, we can get way out of line on either one of those words. If I say, it's us who are mature, humbly mature. The other people, <laughs> you know, they have no clue. Us, we're mature. Those of us who are. No, he's saying those of us who come into this idea, this Reality, this perfection of Christ, that when the perfect is come, it says, when that which is perfect, what is, it, what is when, who's coming that's perfect? Is it a who or is it a what? Does it mean that the stuff is coming soon? You know, we, the stuff I want from God, the prayers I pray, I want things from God, I need things from God, God help me, God help me, I pray for this, I pray for that, I pray for the other thing. You know, that's coming. Is that what he's talking about? In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, when that which is perfect is come. What is he? Just give me a sign here. Is that, what is that? Who is it? Or what is it? You can say it. Come on. Jesus. Oh, somebody said Jesus, 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 Jesus. Yes. It's when Christ has come. 
then we will know him the way he knows us. Till then we see through this glass, it's kind of smoggy or foggy. Smog and fog, same kind of E. 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 We see dimly through a glass. And so as a result, Paul talks in terms of having received this thing, that all of us then who are mature should take such a view of these things. What is your view of the power of his resurrection? What is our view of the power of his resurrection? Is that part of the deposit kind of a little weak part of the deposit? We think of those in terms. What about what he said and participation in his sufferings? I don't really want to, I mean, I don't really think that I'm called to suffer. I mean, God, I mean come on. I mean, that's people a long time ago, you know. I'm not really in a position to. You see, what we're doing is we're kind of saying, it, we say with suffering, and we talk about resurrection, we talk about this issue of becoming like him in his death. When Paul talks about these things, he puts what he wants to know, how he wants to know Christ, what he wants to know about Christ in this. I mean, verse 10, do you see it there? I want to know. Yes, to know, he says. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection. The very quality that saves us, the very quality that Christ has most significantly planted in us by his faith is a belief that he rose from the dead. I, used to, I was listening to someone's testimony this week and they were talking about um, my mentor. All the way back in the 1973, I met, did you know that we met McLaughlin's in 1973. Yeah, he went to a bookstore in Rockville. He'd just become a Christian through various uh, circumstances. And this man went over to a, a bookstore in Rockville, and it, was a, it turned out to be a Christian bookstore. And he had this pastor come in who was uh, part time at the bookstore, working part time at the bookstore. And he started asking him some questions. He said, are, are you guys, um, do you believe that in Jesus Christ and what he has done at the cross? And they said, yeah, yeah. I said, do you believe that he was resurrected? Yeah, yeah, we do. We do believe that. <laughs> Why would somebody want to ask those kind of questions? What if I asked you, do you believe that Jesus died for your sins? So, oh, yes, oh, yes. Do you believe he rose from the dead? <laughs> Never thought about that before. Do you see that when the deposit is placed in us, it puts a burden on us. It puts a stress into us to know what this is that's happened, what this is that Christ has done. And the measure to which we could care, couldn't care less about that is the measure to which we should assume our salvation extends. I don't think salvation is, you know, kind of this way. But whether or not we've really embraced the perfection, the perfect, and whether we've really come into a place. You see the, the, what took place in Paul? He, he says, I'm, I strain for these things. I strain for them. I press on, in verse 12, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ has taken hold of me. I forget what's behind. I strain, he says in verse 13, toward what is ahead. I press on toward the mark. Hear that? I press on. I strain. Why does that happen in me? Is that anybody's question? It certainly becomes a question because he says all of us then who are mature, who are perfect, who have a perfect understanding, have a perfect idea, should take such things or should take such a view of things as this. 
And then he qualifies it by saying, but if any, but if some point, uh, but if on some point you think differently, then God will make that clear to you. Not everybody gets it. Not everybody's there. Not everybody's working on it. Not everybody's being pressed. Not everybody's being overwhelmed. Not everybody's bothered. It's, it kind of is like a being bothered by something. You ever just have a day when you wake up and you're, walk, you're kind of doing your day and something's just bothering you? You don't know what's bothering you, but something's bothering you. Anybody like that? that happens to me all the time. Something's bothering me. And I'll try to think, what is it? Was it, was it that? No, that doesn't really bother me. Was it that? Mm, no, not really. And then I, if I bring it out in the open, I'll get suggestions. Well, maybe it's this, maybe it's that. No, it's not really that. So I finally sit down and I say, Lord, what is it that's bothering me so much? And I get the strangest answers to that question. You ever heard the song, This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. If heaven's not my home, then Lord, what will I do? You ever heard that? There's something about this world that just bothers us. Because there's something that's just not quite right. I want to live as a Christian, but when I start living as a Christian, it's not like everybody comes and barrages me and says, oh, you know, don't be a Christian anymore. But little things like, do you want to hope and pray? Or do you want to buy this product that you can put on the Internet and it'll put your resumes out for you? you want to just hope and pray? Or do you want this other thing? It's a little, you know, a little thing you hear on the radio. Have you ever heard the ad? Does that bother you at all? It's like the world's out there just bothering us. Constantly. I find myself just about to jump out of my skin when someone starts giving me some evolutionary digest and talks about the Billions and billions, why not? Billions of years. Why don't you say billions times billions, okay? But it's billions, they say billions and billions. It's like, you know, three times three is nine. Or you can say one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Billions and billions of years. And our ancestors, millions of years ago, I've got a new Bible. Well, it's a not, I, I'm trying to read this chronological Bible. And this chronological Bible is trying its best to not use the word evolution in it. But it describes these certain ages. And it assigns them to about an 8,000-year period. When he, and then it goes on to say, but some believe these periods are much longer than this. And I say, you're right, because those you're trying to say that's not evolution, but that's an evolutionary process. You think, man was raised from the dust. God took dust. So, evolution. Red dust. Ooh, ooh. Dust, 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 dust. And then he arrives, and here's Adam going, oh, wow, that's great. Well, you know, if that was true, there'd be probably five million other people before Adam, all in different forms. You think you all die off in evolution? Evolution doesn't just fall one strain until it gets to the end. No, it spreads out all across the place. It's billions and billions and billions. It'll say things like how many people lived at the time of Adam. And at the time of Adam, I'm thinking, what time of Adam? When he's in the garden all by himself with Eve, when he was the only person, only man on earth? What are you talking about? It's calling us. It bothers us. <laughs> bothers me I'm often told dad just be quiet during the movie <laughs> if I go to the movie with my son David I'm sorry my somebody <laughs> and he's sitting there next to me like this and I'll go like this I'm going to say he goes he goes I don't want to hear this. He leans the other way. In fact, sometimes he goes, shh, be quiet. I, almost like, I see it. I get it. I see the same thing you do. Just relax. 
There's others who have a different viewpoint. And he doesn't even qualify it as just a completely different viewpoint. He's not really talking about non-Christians here. He says only, let us live up to what we have already attained. Again, this word attained in the Greek language, very interesting word. It means stay in the line. Stay in line. Okay? Now, when you, we, we, if you go downstairs during the week, you'll see these teachers, and they're getting their kids to stay in a line as they walk. And, you know, it's, it's really, it's, they're very good at it. And you're like this, and some, I'm talking everybody in the line's doing that. Then you go, hey, stay in line. <laughs> and they go, whoo, I've got to stay in line. Go to the bathroom, stay in line. Go back to the bathroom, stay in line. Go outside, stay in line. Go upstairs, stay in line. Go on the playground, whoo, go where you want. <laughs> Am I right? Yeah. Stay in line. We don't have to have a perfect notion of this. We don't have to come to a place where we got everything. We're never going to get that. Even Paul's saying, I don't have the complete perfection. It's the concept. It's the idea. It's the gospel that we see. And some people are in the front of the line. They're leading the other people. They're helping them to see where to go because they've already seen it. Watch that rock. Watch this. Watch that. They're, they're leading the line. Some people in the middle of the line. Some people just got in the line. But stay in the line. If you want to come to a place of maturity, a place of understanding the perfection of the gospel, if you want to get to the place where those things don't bother me, if, they, if you stay in the line, things are going to start bothering you. I mean, I always tell the story of my mother. Things bothered my mother. You know, this very attractive woman is selling this cologne. and This has been years ago. Does they even sell English leather anymore? I don't know. And mm, mm, all my men wear English leather, or they wear nothing at all. Turn that off! We're not having that filth in our house. <laughs> Man, we've come a long ways, Mom. Maybe too far. Maybe things should bother us a little bit more. Stay in the line. Let us live up to what we have already attained. The little things that you've learned, don't just abandon those. Keep those. Teach those. So understand. So the person in the line, it's like, you know, the first five people in the line, man, they're really great. The last 35 people, they're all over the place. They got lost someplace on the trail. Stay in the line, he says. Don't forfeit the things that you've already come to. The resurrection of Christ. What do we know about the resurrection of Christ? What do we know about his suffering? What do we know about the cross? What do we know about his atonement? What do we know about his person? Think about him. Stay with him. Yesterday I listened to a lecture of John MacArthur and his disturbance about the ministry of Billy Graham. And I'm thinking, now wait a minute, Billy Graham, you're not going to get away with talking about Billy Graham. And then he shows clips of Billy Graham with Robert Schuller and with other people during the, the, the 70s, and, 70s and 80s. Even then he was showing his kind of his age, you know, when you're 98 when you die or something like that, you know, 25 years before that, still looking... Well, you know, kind of, kind of like you're getting there. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And please listen to it. He said, what is the state of the Christian church? And Billy Graham says, it's in great shape. I think it's fantastic. It's wonderful. And he keeps, keeps on talking. Next thing he's talking about, you know, Muslims and Catholics and, and uh, Hindus and, and all kinds of different categories of what we consider false religions. And he said, Christ is in all of those religions. Christ is calling people from all of those religions. And he says, and some of those people don't even know the name of Jesus Christ, but I believe I'll see them in heaven. I don't know about you, but when I say it to you, that's shocking. That is shocking to me. 
And I said, when I heard, I thought, somebody's dubbed this guy. It's dubbed. And so I look at the other 10 clips of the same thing, the longer versions. And the, and the stuff he leaves out is worse than what was in it. He says, I don't believe there's going to be any world revival. I think the, there's too much evil in the world. And as a result, I think that God's just, you know, calling us all together. He starts talking about the good attributes of Islam and how Islam, you know, there's people in Islam that are Christians. And he said, even Muhammad thought that Jesus was the greatest prophet except for himself. He actually said that. I felt my, talking about being bothered, I feel like my heart is breaking. I thought, this is the person we thought was out there preaching the gospel. He says, people can come to Christ without hearing the message of Christ. Because they're good people. God's calling them. They're good people. God's calling them. And he actually said to them, you mean without the Bible, people can get saved? Oh, yes, he says. Well, I don't know where he got out of line. Paul's saying, stay in the line. Stay in the line. Articulate the gospel. This is not something that, you know, we don't see the fight over this issue of being birthed of the Spirit, of being, believing the Bible is God's Word. You know, those two things, those top two things have been surveyed for the last 50 years by several organizations who've taken polls each year to see where these doctrines are, and particularly the doctrine of the birth. I've, I've, born, I've been born of the Spirit into Christ. He is, I've been born into him. And secondly, I believe the Bible is God's word. Now it's, it's dipped some, but those are still strong beliefs of people. And it becomes the identifier of whether someone is a Christian. And people have fought for this. Harold John Ockengay, who was the founder, one of the founders of Gordon-Conwell with Billy Graham, one of the founders of, of the organization, started an organization in the 1940s called the Evangelical Society. National Evangelical Society. And in this, he and uh, Machen, Graham Machen, and a host of other men, well, not a host, but many other men, they held firmly to the idea of a spirit birth in Christ. And it was already being rejected rejected by German theologians all over the place. No, that's not necessary. It's just loving him and receiving his love and knowing his love and this kind of stuff. And the issues of the, the virgin birth of Christ, his special um, atonement, his, his relationship of incarnation, of being God-man, his telling us that we need to be born again, his death, his burial, his resurrection, his ascension, his sending the Holy Spirit, these basic things... You find people going all over the place with these things. Just, I don't really want to teach that stuff anymore. People then putting Paul in opposition to Jesus Christ. Happens in the 1930s. To where Machen wrote this book called Christianity and Liberalism. You should read that book. It's, a, it's not very big. It's a little book. Christianity and, and um, I just said, liberalism. And you read this book, you think, oh, somebody wrote this, just wrote this this year. He wrote this in the 1930s where these men are giving up their reputations. Christianity today, when it was formed, it was formed by those few men as an evangelical voice. What was the evangelical to, voice to? Great, great voice of liberalism, of moving away from the inspiration, canonicity of the Scripture. And that's not important. All the Bible's not inspired. Too many mistakes, da-da-da-da-da. And these men would write books and volumes on this subject trying to hold the line. Stay in the line. Hold the line. Even some of that number got out of line, left it. He says, only let us live up to what we have already attained. Let us stay in step with what we have already learned, what we've already understood, what we already gained. Don't give it up because it's not popular anymore. If you find yourself in a position where you're talking about Jesus Christ and you talk about him being the incarnate Messiah, the God-man, if you find yourself in opposition with people like that, hold the line. Join together 
in following my example, brothers and sisters. Work together on this project. Work together on this perfection. And just as I, just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. He's really opening up the idea of staying in the line. Live the gospel. Believe the gospel. Preach the gospel. Why? For as I have often told you before and now tell you again in tears, many live as enemies of the cross. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. You know I'm going to talk about it, right? Four things. He talks about this with tears. Because in Paul's letters, you hear him say things like, so-and-so left me at that place. So-and-so abandoned me. So-and-so never came back. So-and-so left. And many others left, he said. Many others left. To the point where Paul finds himself so often in a place all by himself. All by himself. Continuing to contend for the faith. That word of contend for the faith. It means to make a planting, to make something sure and firm so that other things can find their stability in it. People who tended the ropes on a large ship. If your job was to tend the ropes on a large ship, you know what that means? You have to go down and make sure that if the waters rise, you have to let the ropes go so that the ship can rise. The waters go down, you let them down. If the water becomes trouble, you have to, you have to sure, be sure that all those ropes hold. You know why? Because if you just leave them like they are, if the water rises, it can tear the whole dock out of a huge place. A ship as it rises, or a ship as it falls, or a ship as it finds itself in troubled waters. I remember one time we were over in Baltimore with some men, it was just a really nice boat ride, you know, really nice. Just the four of us, we're going to have lunch together. So we pull into a dock and... Some guy goes by on a bigger boat, goes like, you know, 500 miles an hour, goes whoom, here, come, and here comes this wake like this. It literally almost threw us into the next boat. Every time the wake, it, it, you know, a wake doesn't just come once, it goes whoom, 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 whoom. What is it to tend the faith? To guard your heart, he says. To stand and guard your heart. What does that mean? How does... The word of God become transmitted to us so that we know how to obey it. How does it come? It comes through the written word of God. I know I've said this a hundred times, and I'll probably say it a hundred more times, but David Wells, who is a historical theologian, he's at um, Gordon Conwell Charlotte, the Extension School in Charlotte, North Carolina, and he was at, at, uh, in um, Hamilton, South Hamilton, when I was in seminary, and I took him, had theology too from him. And he once said that people have lost touch with God because they have lost touch with the Bible through which God reveals himself. I wrote that down, and I, honestly, I guess I can remember a few other things that he said. But that impressed me so much, and I believe it is such a core issue. If we feel like, well, I don't know these things, Pastor. I just get them from you. You know, you go up here and you kind of rant and rave about all these special things. <laughs> That's nice. Good to get that. It's good to get that way. But these things are also there for you. They're, they're, they're for us. Where are they? Where do, you say Jesus is my Lord, right? How do we express that relationship? How does he express it? How do we express it? How does he tell us the things that he is Lord of? How do we communicate with our master? By his word. There is a fight going on now. And if you, it's like, you know, it's like a fight happened. You say, I didn't see it. Boy, you know, it was a huge fight. Where were you? They don't say, Oh, it was a huge fight. Did, weren't you there? You were standing right there. Didn't you see the fight? No, they don't say that. They say, where were you? We don't have a sense of the line that we're in, of the pattern that we're following, of our Lord's host before us, that a 
committed themselves to what he is teaching, what he's taught. We don't have a sense of that. The question is, you're not in line then. I see these things with my parents. I was, they were in line. I see these things with my Christian friends. They're in line. I see it in this congregation. I believe many of us are in line. Let us join together in following the example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. Paul's just simply saying, look, he's not saying, I'm, of course, in the beginning of the line. I want you to know I'm in the front of the line. I know more than anybody else. So watch me. And I've had, I've had people try to get, in this, get somebody in this trap, and I've seen somebody fall into it. Well, follow me as I follow Christ. That's what Paul said, and that's what I'm saying to you. Follow me as I follow Christ. Now they, whoa, stop. Follow Christ. Just keep in line with Christ. That is the line you want to be in. You know, I, I tend to be a wanderer myself. So, you know, let's, let's get back in the line. Let's stay in line. And let's follow those who are following Christ. So you say, you're just in the line for a while and you kind of thump the person in front of you and say, where are we going? How do I know? What, do you think I'm in line or something? You go, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> you follow me, you follow a person, they might, they might be in line, they might be there, but the words that we're speaking are the perfection. That's the perfection. That's where we know we're in the right place, in the right line. For as often, as I told you before and will tell you again, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is in their shame. enemies of the cross of Christ. There's something just blatantly, I don't believe what you say. There's some people that call themselves atheists against God. And that's an operation. It's not, you know, people say, you know, when someone's 13 years old and they say, well, I'm just an atheist. You think, you're nothing. You don't even know what you believe at all. I mean, okay, what's an atheist? Tell me what you don't believe. Well, I don't believe in God. Okay, well, what does that mean? Well, it means I don't believe in him. Oh, what does that mean? Well, I just don't. You say, right, you really, you got us on the ropes here, buddy. You know, there's some people who plan and they explore and they study the scriptures. They try to find things that can be entanglements for the hearts of a Christian. We find these people in cults, for example. We find these people not only in cults, we fall in the society we're in. People who've already got this whole thing kind of worked out so when they get you, they can tangle you up and they can quite prove that you're wrong. They think. And there's societies that come together and they study this. And they make statements. It's not just Christianity. It's all religions. I don't believe in God in any form, in any place. And they can articulate other religions for you. They kind of fascinate you with the ways they talk about the stupidity of the belief systems of world religions. But they're always going to get back to Christianity. And they always have the biggest trouble with Christianity because Christianity is a reasonable faith. It can stand up to this. Christianity is not fighting against people who are strong. It's fighting with people that have lies that they're trying to spread. And exposing those lies is not that hard Just, I don't believe it, therefore you're stupid. That's not an argument. That's not a person who is a real threat to anybody. They won't listen to anything you say. That's that's a threat. He said, some people are against the cross. However, their destiny is destruction. You know, one of the hardest people to think of as being aimed for destruction is someone who's successful in the world and they help all kinds of people. How many people have you helped in your life? We know people have given billions of dollars to people. They've helped stop diseases. They've, you know, caused people, their whole nations to change. And they they call themselves entrepreneurs and and they're very wealthy. They call themselves benefactors and all kinds of other words that means I give and me, I'm so special and I give. What about God? Well, God's the reason all this happened. I'm changing it. 
That's quite a deception, isn't it? Sadly, without Christ, without the Bible's message of Jesus Christ and Him crucified, that person's destiny is destruction. God is their stomach. The world and its delicacies. Have you ever eaten a whole clam fresh off the boat in Essex, Massachusetts? And they literally deep fry them, and the deep frying causes the clams to die. Oh, boy, that's really good eating. I can't wait to get back to Massachusetts so I can eat those clams. In fact, you know what I do? I have, them trans I have them ported to me live from Massachusetts, deep freezed. So I... Thanks. I see what your gospel is. Thank you. Do we want to find ourselves entering into conversations with people about what they eat? Or not eat? Paul says it has little value. Exercise. You can just see it as you look at me, can't you? I'm somebody who really is into exercise. We, I watched a triathlon yesterday, the women's triathlon in Bermuda. And I watched the whole thing because I wanted to see the end. It's about a four-hour event, three-hour three hour event. I, I kicked out in the middle when the and I watched her keep going around these things. And you know what? The more she ran, the more I just felt like I could do that. <laughs> in fact, I think there's some value of just having watched it that I, I kind of participate in it somehow. Coming across the finish line, you stop. You hear it? You go, ah. See how I, just like her. In fact, I did a little better than she did. You know, ah. Throw it away. You know, it's like that stupid idiot that I go with whatever car because I like control bad. You know, whatever. <laughs> you know, we laugh at the world instead of going to be like the world. Wish I could eat those kind of things. Wish I could eat it. Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. Just a little above my budget. Oh, you haven't really had steak until you've written at Morgan's in, where is it, uh, Kentucky. <laughs> they wouldn't even let us in Morgan's. Because we didn't have a tie on. And we didn't look like somebody could afford the menu. Morgan's, man, Morgan's. We look at that, they got the menu out there. You know, this little tiny piece of steak they got, $45. You go, adios, amigos. <laughs> And their glory is their shame. Their glory is me. Lord, let us recognize that there's an enemy out there. And that enemy isn't just out there. That enemy is calling to us, and it's calling to our children. And it's calling to our marriages. It's calling to men. It's calling to women in marriage. It's calling to... All of us. It's calling. Do you ever empty your spam folder? You got, I get a lot of spam, I, my thing. And so I look in there, it says, you know, 14,000 so on spams. And so I say, well, I'll make, make sure I didn't miss anything. Well, 14,000 things, a lot of things to go through. Or, or at least 1,400, I don't know if it's 14,000. So I'm going through this thing and I, you know what I say? Hi, John, it's uh, Gloria, it's Gloria. What are you doing tonight? I go, what's that? Eh, get her out of here. It's filled with this junk. People calling to you. I don't read it, of course, just from Gloria, you know. But I don't read it. <laughs> it's calling to us. It's like the, the man who, the fool, it says in Proverbs, who walks down the street and she calls to him. She calls to him. And he kind of stops like, 
That was a pretty, where did that come from? Next thing you know, here she is, she's down. He says, my, my husband's gone. My, my house is clean. My bed is ready. It's perfumed. We can spend all night together. And he says, and he's like a, a or ox, just kind of walks with her. And the proverb ends with this phrase. It's pretty chilling. But he does not know that it will cost him his life. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Their mind is set on earthly things, verse 20, but our citizenship is in heaven. I was listening, I was in a small group discussion the other night, and... Uh, one of the men talked about how discouraged he was, and he's an older fellow. Yeah, he doesn't have a job anymore, and he, he can't get this, that, and the other thing, and you know, da 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 da. Just made a quick list. And I said um, to him, Do you know what the blessed hope is? Do you know what that is in the Bible, our blessed hope? No. It's heaven. It's recognizing that we're persons who are here on this earth, but heaven's where we're headed. And the hope, not just of heaven getting our mansion and walking on streets of gold. I can see us out there now, you know, the greedy. They're on the streets with their pick, hitting that thing, getting that brick, sticking here, sticking there, taking all these bricks all over them, saying, man, I am rich. Would you put down the street particles, you know, the materials? Gold means nothing in heaven. And the words of Christ, don't let your hearts be troubled. You think he's just talking to his disciples because they look like they're troubled people? He's talking to us, don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe in me, he says. In my house are many rooms. If it were not so, why would I have gone there and prepared a place just for you? If it wasn't true, why did I do that? So that where I am, there you can be also. You know, I, I remember the first time I heard Blessed Hope. I think I was probably 24, 25, 20 something like that. No, I guess it was more like 31, 31, yep. My 31st year, and I was reading a book called The Blessed Hope by George Eldon Ladd. Great book. And most of it was about heaven. And I, most of it I didn't, I'd never even thought of before, never even looked at before. Never, you know, Thessalonians and, and Paul's statements about the twinkling of an eye will be changed and will be like him and will forever be with the Lord and expounding on those ideas of forever being with the one who we've put our complete trust in for life, eternal life. Just, just the ideas of heaven, thinking of heaven. And I prayed, I said, Lord, give me a blessed hope. So when I look at this world and I see the discouragements of my life, I don't just think, well, i got to somehow figure out how to get all these things untied so that sometime in the future things can be better. We, we're so carnal in our view. We want to get work out for this life. Well, i got to do this so in this life things will be good. Well, Jesus said in this world you're going to have trouble. If you're working to get out of trouble, get out of, get into your some perfect bliss on a boat someplace and your own perfect island someplace. Retirement. Oh, man. Have you ever retired? Isn't it just wonderful? You just, it's blissful, right? You just, everything's great. You, know, you don't want to worry about anything anymore. It's just great. America. All you do is just kind of tool around and you're, you know, no. We, we used to have a motor home for about six months and we couldn't afford it, so we went back to this. And then, you hear all these stories while well, we couldn't afford it. You say, where's the retirement? Well, you know, it kind of sucks. <laughs> That's why I hope to expire, not retire. <laughs> We do. We put a lot of hope into this world. I look to the mountains. Where does my strength come from? That's what the psalmist says. Where does my strength come from? It doesn't come from mountains. It doesn't come from some place of bliss, some Shangri-La, some place in my future. It doesn't come from mountains. It comes from the Lord. My hope is in the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And Paul is 
calling in the same direction to us. Part of the perfection is a blessed hope. Part of those who see the perfection is the perfection does not come into full flower here, now. If you're hoping for something to happen now, it's not going to happen now. It's going to happen in Christ's presence. We want it now. We want something now, but unfortunately the world, those enemies of the cross, those for meant for destruction, those with their stomach as their God, and those whose glory as their shame, they provide a world, heavenly world, and so often we find ourselves trying to get it, trying to find it. What, we find it in what kind of church I want to go to, what kind of family I want to have, what kind of community I want to live in, who I want to live with. We do all these things to try to see this heavenly place. But our citizenship, he says, that thing that we have been marked for, I'm a citizen of heaven and eagerly wait a savior from there. Christ Jesus, the Lord, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that we will be like his glorious body. There's something wonderful about talking about that at length at a funeral. Because the person who you're there for isn't listening. And so you talk about the glories of those who have hope. We're not like those, Paul said, who have no hope. You can stick me in a cell, you can burn me, you can torture me, you can restrict me, you can try to stop me, but I'm just going to a different place. This is not my home. Don't let me go so I can go back to my home. I'm going to my home. And ultimately, that is the way we see life. It becomes the thing that shapes us. It recognizes we're citizens. You know, you're a citizen. You have certain rights, certain things you deserve, certain allegiances you keep. And Paul is saying that there is a perfection calling us. The perfect one is calling us to live a life worthy of his calling and the calling that we have received in this life. Amen. Amen. Let's all stand together.